Here in the United Kingdom, and particularly in London, we are knee deep in the shenanigans by the prime minister and government ministers and others regarding a scandal that has become known as Partygate. It's not a scandal, it's basically a series of incidents which together have contributed to a serious questioning of the integrity and the moral probity of government today in the face of the COVID lockdown rules of 2020, a mere one year, one year plus ago. Now, even those of you who are uh, watching this episode in Armenia, in Nagorno-Karabakh, or elsewhere in the world, and not only in England or the UK, will have surely heard of all the accusations being banded about of the dissimulation, of the untruthfulness of some of the uh, statements. And it just makes me wonder whether when we are, when we say we are so proud of our liberal democracy and the United Kingdom, whether you like it or not, is one of the mothers. Yes, liberal democracy has many mothers, is one of the mothers of democracy. It is quite interesting to see how these things happen when a streak of populism and self-interest overwhelms not inserts itself, it's almost always there across the world, it inserts itself predominantly in the daily makeup of government. But to get away from all this, to get away from Partygate, to get away from all that is happening just down the road from me, I'm going to welcome you today to a fresh episode of Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenian matters, and this is number 28. Here in the UK, here in London, let me just bring the example of two acquaintances, I might actually call them both friends, with whom I often have discussions, sometimes brief, sometimes longer, about what is happening in Armenia in this spiritual homeland for all Armenians across the world. We often talk about things to do with the war in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, the awful war that led to a, an Armenian defeat only a year or so ago. We talk about COVID, we talk about the economy, but inevitably the conversation comes back to the Prime Minister Nicole Pashinyan. And these two acquaintances, friends, basically symbolize two very different approaches to this man, to this uh, Prime Minister. One of them, when I talk about this uh, reality in Armenia today and what is happening, he would support Nikol Pashinyan and say that he is a vast improvement on his predecessors, uh, Robert Kocharyan, Serge Sarkisian. I'm not sure we've actually touched upon Levon Der Petrosian. Perhaps that's a little bit too much in the uh, cobwebs of memory. He would say that, listen, he might have his faults. He's not perfect. He came on the back of a peaceful revolution, and he's trying to do his best. So we should give him every leeway to move forward the economy, the reforms that he promised when he moved into office. And he would remind me, and if he doesn't, I realized that this man, Nikol Pashinyan, has won two elections. And for me, living in some sort of a democracy, a pseudo-democracy, if you want, in the UK, I believe in the results of an election. We shouldn't just dismiss those results because we don't like them. Now that's one acquaintance, one friend. The other acquaintance or friend, the minute I mention uh, Nicole Pashinyan's name, the shutters come down 
And this friend has told me that sometimes he can't even sleep at night because he gets so upset and so affronted by some of what uh, this man is doing to Armenia and how he's destroying all hopes for Armenia. And he can give me a lot of examples from the atrocious defeat in 2020, which had nothing to do with him really, 2019, 2020. Uh, he talks to me about other issues as well, but that is not the point. The point is that the man can't even sleep at night sometimes when he follows his Facebook page and realizes some of what is being written by other Armenians about the misdeeds of this man in power today in Yerevan in the Republic of Armenia. And I think this, in a sense, symptomatizes the Armenian reactions, the Armenian temperament, political temperament, but also personal temperament to uh, what is happening in Armenia today. Now, I'm not here just making broad statements, which I'm sure you yourselves would know about and would make. And I'm not only here to pinpoint two starkly differing political views, nor for that matter, am I here to talk about any politician, whether in uh, London or in Yerevan, playing fast and loose with the rules. But what I'm going to do is basically reflect the concern and interest of Armenians, me, about what is happening in Armenia on a whole range of issues. And let me start with three events that caught my attention. The first one is the story about how the mayor of Yerevan, who was a supporter of Nikol Pashinyan, but apparently fell out uh, with him and with his party. And I'm not going to go into the details because yes, the details are important, but I'm basically doing very broad brush strokes here. So forgive the looseness of the argument as in a sense. The mayor of Yerevan, when he fell out with uh, his boss, I suppose, uh, Nicole Pashinyan, he basically was shunted out of the office and somebody more amenable to Pashinyan's views was actually instated as mayor of Yerevan. That caught my attention and I thought, hmm, I wonder what would happen if somebody says tomorrow, I don't like uh, our own mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, because he is, comes from the Labour Party. The government is a Tory Conservative Party. They don't get on well together. We should go tomorrow, tomorrow, kick him out, and put somebody else in his place. It jars. It jars for people who look at politics and democracy slightly in a dispassionate way. But then something has happened, and that is the fact that suddenly I found out that as part of the defense treaty that some of the uh, Eurasian countries have with Russia as well, that a number of troops were sent to Kazakhstan to quell the violence that had taken place there and the protests that were being seen everywhere on the telly uh, against the president of uh, Kazakhstan, who is a close ally of uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, okay, there is a treaty, and I understand that Armenia has to fulfill its obligations uh, according to that treaty, not least because if one day it needs to invoke that treaty of defense, then it doesn't want to risk uh, the Russians or the others saying, well, you didn't, you refused to send people in uh, to Kazakhstan, why should we bother sending to defend you uh, troops uh, or soldiers uh, to Armenia? I get that point, but you also might get my point, which is that 
for a man who came on the back of a revolution that was going to get rid of oligarchs and dictators and autocrats to basically send troops, whether it's three Armenian soldiers or 3,000 Armenian soldiers. I'm not talking numbers, I'm talk talking here uh, principles. That also is a jarring reality, for me at least. Now, the third thing also that uh, drew my attention is the fact that a lot has been said about this as well, and a lot has been written in various, various dispatches of the quote unquote constructive negotiations that took place in Moscow uh, between Armenia and Turkey in an attempt to normalize relations. Now, interestingly, there are a couple of interesting points on this. One, the venue, Moscow, which is one way that Putin is basically saying, I'm still in charge of this brief. You come to uh, Moscow to have those negotiations. That is an achievement for the Russian president and bravo to him for that. But the second point also is the people who were sent as the negotiators. On the Turkish side, you had Serdar Kilic, who, as you might have heard, was an ambassador in a Turkish ambassador in Washington, DC. And for that matter, he also is known to be an Armenian genocide denialist. But he's a man of considerable experience. Facing him was Ruben Rubinian, whom Incidentally, I don't know either. He's one of those new generations, not of my generation. I'm past it in a sense. Ruben Rubinian, his only claim to fame, as I understand it, is that he's a loyal member of Nicole Pashinyan's party. But politically, pretty much a neophyte compared to his Turkish counterpart. Is he the right man to send? Uh, uh, to Moscow for those negotiations. And anyway, the negotiations took place. And the focus of those negotiations is the fact that after Armenia's independence, the borders closed between Turkey and Armenia in 1993, and there are attempts being made now to renormalize relations, to open the borders, reinstate. Uh, charter and regular flights between Yerevan and Ankara and other uh, cities, and in a sense, restart, reboot uh, commercial ties so that cheaper uh, Turkish products could come uh, into Armenia with all the consequences on the economy, both positive and negative. Now here I stop again to just share with you or suggest to you two points that crossed my mind on these negotiations. Okay, they happened, it was the first round, uh, they were meant to be constructive, uh, there will be other uh, negotiations, I am sure, but uh, the thing that drew my attention here is, hold on, we've been there, haven't we? I mean, what about the 2009 protocols? I still remember, Hillary Clinton then in Switzerland, waiting, hoping, exercising her uh, mobile phone, her cell phone, if you want, uh, trying to chivy along both sides to sign uh, these agreements so that there would be a normalization of relations. Did that happen? No, it didn't happen. The uh, protocols never saw the light of day. And in fact, they were abandoned in 2018, some three years ago. And why? Not necessarily, in my opinion, because Turkey had a sudden change of heart at the last minute when they looked at the paper, but it's because I think that at that time, Azerbaijan told Turkey that it is very unhappy with this uh, agreement. And at the end of the day, we know how close Turkey and Azerbaijan are, uh, and had it not been for this military alliance, this closeness, I think the outcome of the Garapakh war 
2019, 2020 will have been somewhat different. Not necessarily Armenians winning the war or defending both uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and the seven occupied regions. No, but it would have been different rather than have now the Azeri president literally gloating at the victory at the expense of quite a few deaths from both sides. So we've, we've seen this before, as we say, I've been there, I've seen that. And of course, those protocols were abandoned. And in fact, not only that, but I also remember, and this is a personal a little story, I remember the then uh, President Serge Sarkisian coming to London as part of his tour of world capitals to try and so-called meet and consult with the Armenian diaspora in order to solicit their opinions about these protocols. I've written about them. I've analyzed them legally then. If I'm supposed to go through my folders, I'm sure I'll find them somewhere. I've, I've talked about them as well. And of course he came, I saw him, there was a, a, a reception, a dinner. Um, I went with another Armenian friend, uh, we were introduced to the president. And of course this was all basically cosmetic. Uh, the dice had been cast, uh, the president was not going to change his mind because Harry Vartan or Sirui did not like uh, the idea of the protocols, not on emotive terms as far as I'm concerned, but on practical terms, that fell through. So the question is, how can we be sure that this round of negotiations will lead to something more substantive, more relevant, and more concrete, particularly since we know that Armenia today is in a much weaker position than in 2009. And therefore, it doesn't hold many Trump cards. In fact, uh, one of the Trump cards, in my humble opinion, that Prime Minister Pashinyan had, and which he just threw away, uh, it was a bargaining chip as far as I'm concerned, was the lifting of the temporary ban on the import of Turkish uh, goods. Uh, I wondered why did he do this before the negotiations became more substantive and more concrete? Was it pressure out or not? I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to give you those three examples and I'm not going to go delving into more examples or into more details. Some of you listening to me know far more about these things than I do. I'm just giving you an impression of an ordinary Armenian whose expertise does not lie in the South Caucasus, but who is concerned about the direction of travel and he's sharing this with you for you to either dismiss and uh, deride this viewpoint or perhaps build upon it and accept it. The mayor of Yerevan, the whole soap around uh, that situation, the uh, Kazakhstan situation, and of course, the negotiations between Turkey and uh, uh, Armenia. Now, this brings me finally to the point that I've often mentioned in my, uh, in my uh, YouTube episodes, which is about the relevance of the Armenian diaspora. I've always said that it's very important for the diaspora and the Republic to communicate, to discuss, to consult each other because they beef each other up and the diaspora has a role to play. After all, let us not forget that Armenia has a population of say nowadays roughly 3 million, a tiny Republic. The Armenian diaspora is 12 million, 10 to 12 million roughly. They must have a voice, not least because Armenians have helped in the past and some of them still do have helped financially the Republic to stand on its feet, and we know that it needs that help now. But you can't expect Armenians to cough up 
all the time and be ready and willing to be at the disposal of the Republic if the Republic does not in return listen or consider their viewpoints. Now, I've also said in the past, and this is something I stand by firmly, that at the end of the day, the decision should be taken by the government in Yerevan and not by Armenians in Los Angeles, in Paris, in Buenos Aires, in Lebanon or elsewhere. But they should be part, they should be contributing to the discourse, to the narrative, to the discussions, because at the end of the day, as I just told you at the start of this short episode, Armenia is a real republic with real concerns, problems, hopes for the three million living there. But Armenia is also a spiritual homeland for the whole Armenian nation across the world. And therefore, it is important to keep that in mind. And it is important when we suggest somebody like Ruben Rubinian, with all due respect to him, I don't know the man, he could be a political wizard for all I know, but that somebody surely more experienced, more veteran, more knowledgeable could have led these negotiations. Just as one example, doesn't, it doesn't all, uh, it's not the uh, be all and end all these negotiations, but just as an example. So these are some of the thoughts that I basically would like to share with you, the concerns, the hopes and the interaction, the osmosis between the diaspora and uh, the Republic, something which is very, very important for me and something that I was keenly aware of when many moons ago I was leading the campaign for recognition of the uh, Armenian um, genocide here in London. We were known by the acronym uh, Crag, and my idea was, I know that the genocide is far more important for the diaspora than for many Armenians living in Armenia, but it is important to talk to both sides. And I used to have then, and I have had then, wonderful discussions with the likes of uh, Salpi Razarian, uh, Vartanos Kanyan, and others who then were in positions of either power or advice. And that brings me to the end of uh, this uh, episode again. And I would like to share with you two links today. One link is a very interesting article I read and it was sent to me and I really enjoyed reading that uh, article. It's in The Spectator by a journalist I don't know at all who basically talked about the role that President Armin Sarkisian has played and is playing in Armenia today in relation to Armenia's place in the world, its economy, its business prospects, its political orientations and his travels across the world, his contacts with many people across the world uh, in order to try and strengthen Armenia's backbone when it comes to uh, the current woes that this small republic is facing. It is a fascinating read, not least because I got to know the man when he first came and opened the embassy in London, again, just down the road here near St. Sarkis uh, Armenian Church. The, the distance between the church and the embassy, Haidun, in the building is Haidun, is about five minutes on foot. And I met the man and I spoke with the man and I know a lot of people, uh, some of them close friends of mine, Armenians from London, who also knew him, who helped him with his uh, papers, who helped him with his financial uh, needs, who helped provide guidance when he first came um, to this uh, country. And I actually remember that I was one of the first people who went to see him in his office with a dear friend from the BBC uh, World Service, it was stationed at Bush House then, who did an interview with him about his hopes for Armenia as he opened, inaugurated that embassy in London. And look now, that man, multi-rich, 
very intelligent, quite successful, is now basically the president of the Republic. So I would urge you to read that uh, article, whether you like the man or not, whether the man has disappointed you sorely or he has met all your expectations, have a read and see what you think. And the second piece, and this one you probably will have guessed, is again one from uh, Civil Net uh, TV uh, from Eric Hakopian. And he said in this 14 minute video clip that uh, Civil Net is trying to re, I'm not going to say reinvent itself, but try to find different ways of presenting uh, opinions and uh, news. And in this one, he talks quite interestingly, and there's some very interesting sound bites in his video clip. Uh, about the cultural wars and the nature of culture in relation to Armenia. So I'll put that second link as well. Those are uh, two links and I'm, I don't need to constantly say this because every time I meet some Armenians who listen to my episodes, they say, why do you keep only uh, quoting Civil Net TV and uh, and uh, Eric Hakopia mostly, sometimes Emilio Criccio as well. The answer is very simple. I don't know these, I don't know both guys, never met them, but I have a high regard for Civil Net TV from the times when uh, Salpi Razarian was there before she left Armenia and Civil Net and went to Southern California to run the uh, Armenia Studies Department at the university there. And also because the majority of the people who listen to me are more English speaking than Armenian speaking. And Civil Net TV has some very good English input, particularly the clips or the thoughts or the analyses or whatever you want to call it that Eric Hakopian uh, comes with. And by the way, his surname and my surname are also spelled differently. I, I just added this to lighten the mood at the end. Uh, have a listen to this episode, see if you think it's worth it, and I conclude with the image. Now the image has a division between them, that brown curtain, which is in, purposely there, and because the two flags of Armenia and of uh, uh, Turkey aren't really talking to each other yet, but also having both the uh, Armenian flag and the Turkish flag reminds me of a book many, many, many years ago that another dear friend of mine, a Londoner now for years and years, George Jurgen wrote about uh, Turks and Armenians reconciled. And he had a picture on the cover of his book of the intertwining of the Armenian and Turkish uh, flags. It's one of his first books, if I'm not mistaken, that George uh, published. And it was a very interesting read. And we had many, many uh, conversations about that. As you notice, these two flags in my image have not interconnected or intertwined, but they are there fluttering in front of each other. And I have absolutely no problem. In fact, I hope that Armenia and Turkey will be able to reach an understanding and that the negotiations would lead huge dividends for both countries. That after all is what international relations and diplomacy are all about. But my only word of caution, not at the expense of one nation against the other, particularly when we know that Turkey is also under pressure economically, but also politically from the Biden administration or what have you to move forward with these negotiations. I leave it there and I wish you a nice Sunday. It's today, Sunday, the 16th of January, 2022. And I hope you find some of what I'm saying interesting. In the meantime, all the best to you.